Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And before we start today's podcast, we want to take a moment to acknowledge what is happening in our country right now. Yeah, we recorded the episode that published on Monday, June 1st, before George Floyd was killed by police in Minneapolis. That, of course, has catalyzed a nationwide protest against police brutality and racism. And we talk about racism all the time on this show. And while we are living in a time that feels to a lot of us unreal and unprecedented, events like this really are not that new. Uh, But historical knowledge does not make our current state of affairs any easier for the people who have been failed by our country over and over. So we wanted to say pretty clearly, if it has not been evident to people, Black Lives Matter. So it feels a little bit strange to be putting out regular history shows now, but that is also still our job. And if you are not feeling it, we completely get it. So you can always hang on to this and uh, come back to it when it feels like a better time. Yeah, this is an interview that was also recorded before these most recent events. It is a discussion with John Scott Dryden, who's the creator, writer, and executive producer of the podcast Tumon Bay. This is a historical fiction show that is set in an imagined city that's inspired by the Mamluk culture. And John very kindly coordinated with Holly to do a transatlantic interview from his home in London. And heads up, uh, in some ways, this may be extra difficult because there is a lot of talk about the slavery of that culture. And John and I are definitely lighter in tone than we probably would have been had we recorded this a couple weeks later. We recorded this back in May. Also... Uh, full disclosure, Tuma Bay is a show that's also part of the iHeartMedia podcast network, as we are. It was originally made as a BBC production, but iHeartMedia partnered with this project for worldwide distribution. So here's my chat with John Dryden. The first thing I want to ask you is, have you always been interested in history? It's an interesting question. I, I haven't really thought about it, but I think probably I always have. I actually did do a history degree, (laughs) so it's odd that I haven't (laughs) thought about it. I I studied medieval trade and agriculture, uh, European. (laughs) Oh, wow. Um, But, um, I mean, I I haven't sort of felt like I was a sort of history geek or anything, but I guess um, I probably was and and am. And I've, you know, I've always been fascinated, particularly, um, although I studied medieval history, I've always been fascinated particularly by the Second World War. I've, I've read a lot about that. And yeah, I, I guess we learn a lot of lessons from the past. Um, my, my fascination with the Second World War is just how people's minds can be controlled on a population level in the way that, um, you know, Nazi Germany did. And, and I guess uh, my interest in history generally is what happens to people and, and how they think um, and how that changes in uh, different ages. I find it really interesting. I, I, maybe this is kind of where history and drama kind of mold together. I'm really uh, interested in what people's motivations are and and in different sort of historic periods, different things um, are acceptable and different things motivate people. And, and I find that kind of interesting. I mean, it, it, just as an example, in the world of... Um, Tumen Bay, which is very much inspired by the Mamluks of Egypt. Um, slavery was was a very uh, the the whole society was built on on slaves. The the Mamluk leaders uh, came as slaves um, and then took over at a certain point and became the rulers. The slaves became the rulers. But in that society, there's there's there are sort of various documents that give you a sense of what daily life was like and 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 having a slave and stuff it was just considered the norm and um it's quite quite interesting you could have a whole society that that doesn't really consider uh anything of something like that um you you could get a bank loan you know to buy a right. slave and right. um, <laughs> it was all it was all completely <laughs> above board there's like no morality questioning going on there at all. That's true. And and then if you look at society today, there's there's various things where we don't really question it either. You know, mm-hmm. like the way we treat animals and stuff. Um, you know, and maybe in years to come, people will look back on this 
period of history and think, ah, oh, it's amazing that people didn't actually question that in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't ask the question, they just accepted it. So that I guess that's my where I come from in terms of my interest in the, these periods. Do you remember how you first learned about the Mamluks? Yeah, I mean, I, I was aware of them. Um, and that's because I was, I was brought up in the Middle East. I was, I was born in, in Kuwait, actually, and my parents lived there. And we spent a lot of time in Egypt. So I, I was kind of aware of them. But I was also aware of how little they've been written about. Um, and and it, it just always seemed like a kind of slightly fascinating little corner of history that no one had quite explored. Tuma Bay is not, you know, is 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 not about the Mamluk dynasty, but it but so much of what we've got in the story is is drawn from that period. And I guess what attracted me to that once I did hear about it um and started reading about it, it was a period of, you know, just two and a half centuries where this group of people uh who were brought out over on a regular basis as as slaves, um they they were um, actually of Turkish origin. They, they weren't Muslims, they were they were Christians. And they were brought over because they had this incredible, uh, you know, uh, uh, they were prized for their fighting and um, and their discipline. And so they were brought over to be part of the army. And they were slaves. Um, they were imported by the rulers of the time. And then at a certain point, um, around 1250, they, they seized power for themselves. So they were then in control for about you know, two and a half centuries. And during this time, it was just extraordinarily uh, brutal. It was it was all about power. There, there was a 50-year period where there were 53 different sultans. You know, they were they were you didn't last very long if you if you were the sultan. So there was there was a lot of people trying to uh, you know take control. Um, but at the same time, the empire and the city of Cairo, where which was essentially their sort of headquarters, thrived. And it, at a certain point of, of, of that period, it was the wealthiest place on the planet to be. And so it attracted people from everywhere else. From People came from Europe, from Asia, from the rest of the Middle East to be there in this city. And so it was a remarkably cosmopolitan place. People came to make their fortunes. And, um, and so that as a, as a society and a world um, and, uh, and a city was hugely fascinating to me. And so I read more and more about it. And I guess that was the inspiration for, you know, for this dramatic story that we set in that society. Yeah. At what point did you realize like, oh, this is going to be the primary thing I pull from to build this world that I'm building? I guess it was a, a biography that I read of the city of Cairo that had a chapter, only a chapter actually about the Mamluks. And I, I think all the kind of political intrigue and skullduggery and the grandeur of it all just really appealed to me as a world that could be built out as a thrilling drama. Um, you obviously read a lot for your own uh, pleasure, clearly. <laughs> but will you talk about when you shift gears and it becomes a little bit about drawing from historical sources to inform your work, what that research process is like, or is it kind of the same thing? Yeah, I think it's kind of the same thing. I find if I'm, if I'm reading for research, I, I, I can never quite get the thing that I'm after. So I tend to not do it very diligently. I just read stuff for interest and then something will stick in my mind. And if it does, I'll write it down and build from that. Um, I mean, once we we pitched and sold the series and we found someone to to fund it, there's, the, there's then also the pressure of having to deliver something. And one of the decisions we made really early on was not to root it too specifically in, in this Mamluk world because it would, in a sense, tie us down to many things. And what we wanted to create was more of a house of cards type story of political intrigue and and draw on that world, but not be bound by it. And it's also, you know, the religion is obviously a big part of that society at that time. And we wanted that, but we didn't want to be drawn on the specifics of any one religion. So so one decision we made fairly early on with Tumen Bay was to create a world that is essentially fictional, um, that has its own language and 
religion and customs, but is drawn from that world. Um, so we were kind of uh, fortunate not, you know, in, in terms of our research, not to have to uh, follow anything through in too much detail. We we could allow ourselves the luxury of, of inventing as well. I was going to ask you how much you take liberty with historical accuracy, but you kind of answered that. So now I'm wondering if you had to give a rough percentage of like how much of the show is pretty true to historical record versus how much is this fictional, fantastical world you've created? Like, what's the breakdown there? Well, we always approach it episode by episode and within a season story arc. And we're thinking character and drama and what can happen to these characters and who can uh, do what. And that's how, that's our process. But when I look back on the episodes and see how much real history there is in there, I'm quite amazed that, that there's a huge amount. <laughs> and I don't know if that's because the stuff we've been reading just kind of seeps in in a weird sort of way that we're not quite realizing. But so much of it is is there. Even quite a lot of the characters are based on real people. I mean, maybe it's because we were we chose this world, um, and it was quite a fortunate society to to pick on because a lot of what goes on in um, in Mamluk society in 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 this period is it feels incredibly modern. Um, and we wanted Tuman Bay to be set in a period other than our world, but to have all sorts of modern resonances. And when I look at Cairo, you know, this this wealthy place um, in the middle of the 13th century, so many of the things that they're dealing with, like air pollution, you know, traffic control, postal services, you know, how to get things to people, banking, mortgages. It, I mean, doctors used to make patients sign disclaimers before performing an operation in case they got sued. Um, <laughs> traders selling on credit, you could buy a slave in installments if you wanted all that kind of stuff it it's just all there and it and it feels very contemporary you know um and so it it wasn't that we deliberately tried to make it um a, 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 an accurate historical drama but because it isn't it's all fiction but a lot of what we've got in there ended up being true to this period <laughs> um was, were there any challenges in integrating that history into the narrative? Like, did it ever kind of roadblock you in a way? Or did it flow so naturally that it was just part of the story without effort? We we always uh, pursued the story first, even if there was no kind of historical precedent for it at all. Um, but there was stuff that we found. So I think the history actually enhanced it in many ways, because there would be things that we read where we thought, oh, that's good. And it would just slot into the drama so well. Um, for instance, you know, in in this particular culture, it was it was an Islamic culture. The depiction of um, human form in any way it, it was forbidden. Um, right. So within the palace, once they became once this this slave dynasty, once they got used to the comforts and stuff like that, there were sort of princes and princesses and stuff like that. And the princesses were not allowed baby dolls because that is in a, a, a depiction of a human form. So they would take babies from, from the slaves who could then become the dolls of children Oosh. in the harem. And, um, and so these young princesses would, you know, would comb the hair and plait the hair and dress them up of real babies. <laughs> they sew clothes for them. And, and sometimes they'd survive. These, um, <laughs> the, right. the, these these slave babies and become quite important in their own right. You know that's quite extraordinary. And and, and so it was things like that that were real um, that we were able to include into the story. Now, when you set out to do a fictional but historical show, were you anticipating that that would just have an audience? Like, how much did you trust that history would have a wide appeal to listeners? We trusted a lot that audiences would like history. I mean, at the time that we uh, started making this, Game of Thrones was was hugely mm. popular. It was commissioned by the BBC. Um, so they had a, a, an audience that we knew were interested 
in history from their research. We didn't really see it as a historical show. Um, we, we saw it as a fast-paced thriller, um, epic adventure that was set in a, a different society to the one we were living in. But we also wanted it to resonate with today. So a lot of things uh, that were going on when season one was made, like ISIS and that kind of stuff in Syria, was was sort of reflected in in this. Um, but we we I guess we felt that if the story was exciting enough and the characters were relatable enough, people would be interested in it, whether it was history or not. But in answer to your question, I think people are interested in history. <laughs> I mean, you, you look at the success of you know Wolf Hall and some of those those stories that really do tell a real history and right. they're not just inspired by history, that they have big audiences. One thing that often happens with us, because I feel like people that like history really like history. Yeah. Um, so a topic, a topic will come up for us and someone will be like, oh, this is actually my area of special interest. And they'll share their information or their research with us that maybe wasn't something that came up on an episode or whatever. Do you hear from listeners who are history buffs who are ready to talk about Cairo during this period or the Mamluks or any of the other elements that have made it in fictionalized form into your show? Yeah, we do. And I'm qu always quite surprised by that um, because I feel that there's nothing about our series that is, you know, that accurate in terms of historical accuracy. And we've had quite a few people who have been academics, you know, working in universities, studying this period <laughs> who've asked us questions about it and, um, you know, for, for their research, um, wanting to know what we've read and how we've got to this and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure they take it as a, a as a, a piece of fiction, um, but I think that on the whole, the, the people that have approached us and contacted us about the series are delighted. You know that history can be used in this way um, and and can reach an audience maybe that wouldn't have known about this period and have subsequently become interested in it. That's the kind of um, message that we're getting from them. I bet it's also kind of fascinating for them to see kind of a different perspective than someone who is strictly an academic, like someone that has taken in the information and then interpreted it artistically may shed light on it in a way that they're not used to when they're just dealing with the academic side of it. I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, most of what I've read of this period is quite dry reading and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very well researched but it it doesn't quite conjure up a world or um or or take you to that place um yeah so i i i mean i wouldn't say we've been contacted by hundreds of historians you know but but maybe you know half a dozen or something like that. <laughs> and they they all seem you know pretty thrilled with it so <laughs> that's very cool yeah um and this show has is now it's gone on four seasons we haven't gotten it globally the fourth season that will come out in uh, later this summer. But I wonder as you go on season to season and story arc to story arc, if it gets harder or easier to think about the historical inspiration from it, does it, as you mentioned with those, that sort of harrowing story of of babies being used as toys, hmm. yeah. does it kind of blossom into new ideas or do you sometimes go, uh, we got to come up with something and we're going to have to not pay as much attention to the history on this one? I guess there's a bit of that. But um, we're always surprised at how the history keeps, you know, turning up new stuff. Um, the recent season has uh, a whole kind of history of assassins who, you know, basically were invented in that period. And that's something we hadn't really touched on before. Also plagues, you know, which again, so much resonance with today, <laughs> the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we're, we're constantly surprised how things that we're, we're just kind of reading about we suddenly think, oh, actually, no, that, you know, we, why didn't we find that before? Because suddenly it seems incredibly relevant today. But we did, uh, as I mentioned, not want to root it absolutely in that period. So we kind of flirted with um, a slightly, um, I wouldn't say supernatural element to it, but these, this, this period was quite a superstitious, superstitious time and people believed in omens and, and stuff like that. So, we have touched on um, characters that have dreams, that maybe have prophetic powers, that that sort of thing. 
but we've never gone completely down that route of making of having dragons or anything like that. It, it's always been kind of rooted in reality. But because of the world that they live in, they believe in in these omens and and prophecies. Um, and sometimes they're so cryptic that you don't really know if they're and if they end up being true or not because the prophecy could have meant <laughs> the, right. the one thing or the other. So we've got you know quite a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think we do keep, when, whenever we're stuck for story, we go back to the history and we 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 sort of, me and my co-writer say, let's, let's go away for a week and just read some stuff. And we always get inspired by that. And um, yeah, I mean, at one point in season three, we flirted with it being uh, more science fiction, um, that the, there is a real sense that this world might exist not just in the future, but might be a world that exists in, not just in the past, but might be a world that exists in the future or on a different planet. Um, you don't really know where Tuman Bay is, but it, it adheres to the rules of this, this history. Um, whenever we've gone down that kind of more science fiction-y route, and, and there are certain sort of odd things about this world. There's two moons, for instance. We, we kind of want to just keep making it slightly off you know, um, but whenever we've gone too far down a science fictiony route, we've always uh, uh, rather regretted it and pulled back. <laughs> <laughs> we said, "Oh, we've written ourselves into a corner." Um, yeah, as soon as there's going to be spaceships or space, you know, all that sort of stuff, then nothing in Tuman Bay seems to matter anymore, and and we want oh, everything right. in the political intrigue, the the lives of these people, to really matter. So we've always resisted that. Um, although, you know, there have been times where it's been quite tempting to go off in that direction. And I can assure you with season four, we have, we've, we've gone right back to the real world. Are there any other historical events or periods that you think would be fun to explore through fiction and do a similar project? I mean, I, I think all, all of it, really. Um, I, th- I think because I work in in fiction, what I'm looking for is good characters ha- having to make difficult moral decisions. And I think most periods of history would interest me in that respect. I'm not sure I would jump straight into another historical epic. <laughs> it sounds like you're kind of ready to do some hard sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably am. Well, I did do this... Um, series Passenger List, which was about yes. a, a plane that went missing. And that was, you know, kind of refreshingly different for me. <laughs> but but actually, no, not really. I mean, most of what I've done has been contemporary. Contemporary thrillers is 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 mostly what I write. Yeah. So in, in some ways, uh, Tomb Bay was the exception for me. But I, but I love all, I love watching all that stuff. You know, Rome was a great mm-hmm. TV series. And, and I loved the way they weaved in, the, you know, the history with the characters. But rather, rather kind of underrated series. I feel. I think it was just one of the best. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure I would do another historical one if the right idea presented itself. And with Tuman Bay, it's it's kind of an extraordinary journey because, you know, when we first pitched it, which was about 2015, we didn't expect it to have such a long journey. It was just a sort of one season story. Um, it's now gone on to four seasons and the fourth season will be the last, although it's possible there may be sort of spin-off stories with characters from, from that universe. But um, it's also, you know, led to, a, there's a TV, an animated TV show in development set in that universe. And we've written a book, funnily enough, <laughs> which um, is about to come out, um, which is a novel set in the Tuman Bay universe and, and roughly follows the story of the first season. And we're in the process of writing a second book. So there'll be another one coming out next year. Ooh, not just a book, but a book series has been spawned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we never expected it to come out. You know, We never expected, <laughs> you know, out of that one idea, all this stuff would emerge. Yeah. Uh, now, do you anticipate, and you may not know the answer to this yet, that that second book will follow roughly the narrative of the second season or is it going to go in a different direction it's going to follow roughly the uh narrative of the second season 
So is it sort of a companion novel that will enrich the the podcast's story? Yes, yes. Perfect. I mean, they, they stand on their own um, and they go much deeper than you could in an audio drama. I think the, the whole world is realized more completely in the novel than, than it ever could be in the audio. Are there any big differences in how you approach the novel in terms of your use of history in it versus what you're doing in an audio drama where you don't really have as much space to flesh out, you know, some of the um, the locations, et cetera, with descriptors? Does that harken back a little bit more to history or are you still pretty free with it? I'd like to say uh, it, we, it was more sort of thorough and test research, but no, we, we were pretty free with it. We, we went again for the the characters and the drama of, of the situation they were in. So the book is out now, so people can dive right into it if they want to. Is that pretty much a case of it's available everywhere? Yeah, it's available in hardback and Kindle. And the paperback comes out, I think, in a few uh, months' time. Cool. It is published by Orion. So it should be available everywhere. It's definitely available on Amazon. um, And um, I should imagine it'll be in most bookshops. And what's the full title of it? The full title is The City of a Thousand Faces, The Epic of Tumen Bay. Cool. Um, here's a weird question, since this is a tie-in to a podcast. Are you doing an audiobook of it? Yeah, there's an audiobook as well. So that's <laughs> so that's on Audible. Um, we didn't have anything to do with that. The, the publishers always do that with, yeah. with books. But um, it's great. I've heard sort of extracts from it. Um, yeah, so it's a complete audio reading of the book. Uh, it's read by an actress called Claire Corbett. She's great. It's uh, really a, sort of a, an interesting idea, right? We are in the midst of kind of a weird time historically, and it's a nice thing that people have at their uh, leisure the opportunity to really just completely immerse in this world that you have created, which is so compelling, like right out of the first episode of season one of Tumon Bay, the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, holy Moses, like you're in. So it's kind of nice that you've built this whole little sort of reprieve for everyone if they want to just go escape for a while. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that that is the idea that it, it, it should feel like such a complete world um, with its own set of rules and it and it's populated with people that you might like or dislike. Um, but yeah, you're, I mean, certainly with the audio drama, the, the idea was to get completely immersed, um, to get the audience completely immersed. Um, and I think definitely in the world we're living in, it's quite nice to uh, escape. It's like being transported to somewhere completely different. It really is. Yeah. I think I described the podcast the first time I heard it as the most visually colorful podcast I had ever heard, just because it is so rich. You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts for work, and I I just felt like you kind of do, even though it is all audio, you get a sense of what this world would look like and smell like and feel like. So uh, bravo to you for that, because it came off beautifully. You know, one of the things with it was, and and this me as a sort of director producer, I I listen to a lot of fiction as well. um, And so much of it seems to depend just on the words. And what what I wanted to do with Tomb and Bay, the the fiction podcast is is make it kind of effortless that you feel that the world is kind of all there without having to worry about what specifically is that sound or um, or have a character tell you exactly what something is. I wanted it to kind of wash over the audience. And, and if you let yourself be drawn into that, then it is a kind of effortless experience. You, you're just in that world and you're looking around and seeing these different situations unfold. That was what I was after, <laughs> rather than, you know, I think explaining things a lot can be quite tiring to listen to. Yeah. I wanted it to be more something that you could experience. Well, mission accomplished. <laughs> thank you. John, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I so appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for the opportunity, Holly. You know, it's great, great to talk to you. I thank John at the end of that interview, but I just want to make sure we thank him again for spending time with me again back in May to talk about Tumon Bay and his love of history and how that project has blossomed. To me, it is really sort of magical that a historical fiction podcast has also now become 
a book series, a television series in development, etc. Uh, you can listen to seasons one, two, and three of Two Mun Bay now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen, just like is the case with our show. And season four of Two Mun Bay will come out later this summer. Again, that book is titled The City of a Thousand Faces, and it is available now, uh, both as a hardback, as a Kindle book, and as an audiobook. And when I mentioned there at the end that he had created this world that one could escape into, I was, of course, talking about the pandemic, not knowing what was about to unfold. Uh, How you deal with current events is different for everyone. So uh, you may or may not want to think about things that you can escape into. And this is certainly a time when we hope that everyone is actively engaged in the ways that suit them best. I have a little bit of listener mail that diverges pretty greatly from this. I'd like to hear it. So it'll be a little light ending to it. Um, This is about our very recent episode on Cannery Row. We've gotten some really fun emails about Cannery Row, uh, for which I thank everybody that did it. Um, This is from our listener, Julie, who says, I'm so excited that you did a show today on Cannery Row and Monterey. My first job out of college was working at the registrar's office at the Naval Postgraduate School. I worked in Herman Hall, which is the historic Hotel Del Monte. Today, the building is used for administrative offices for the school, but it is also still a working hotel under Navy Gateway Inn and Suites. I have stayed there many times since leaving Monterey, and it's a treat. You do need to be affiliated with the military to stay there, though. The old hotel building is opulent and beautiful. It's neat to explore, as there are at least a dozen ways to get to any single room or office. My office was in the basement of the building, which was still lovely. There is a bar in the basement of the hotel called the Trident Room that opened around 3 p.m every day. I sat at the registrar window where students could come and add and drop classes, and my days went to 5 p.m., and more than once, a student who had enjoyed the Trident Room a little too much wandered around the corner, discovered our office, and asked me about changing grades. I have many dear memories of working at NPS, and I even met my husband at a new student orientation in the ballroom of Herman Hall. At the time, I had a personal rule against dating any military officer students because I didn't want to be a military spouse and get uprooted every few years. Well, I have been a Navy spouse for eight years, and I have lived all around the country and loved it. Thank you for the podcast. I hope you enjoyed reading a little more about what's going on these days at Hotel Del Monte. Uh, Julie, thank you so much. Congratulations eight years later on your wedding. Um, thank you for sharing this little bit of history. I have suspected that it is probably really, really beautiful inside that building still, so it's good to hear that that is, in fact, the case. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast anywhere you listen. That includes the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.